This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. We've spoken before about the mysterious list of shoulds. You know, all those things that society tells us will make us happy, only to find out it's a big lie. Joining me today is Liz Passaran to chat about her should story and how our real quest should be uncovering our purpose. Hi, Liz. Hello. So... This, it's something I've talked about before is this, this list of things that we do in life. I don't even know who wrote the list. I don't even know who's checking off the boxes on the list, but it's a trap that I fell into where you just start living life. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. What's your story of, you know, your journey to discover your purpose? Well, just like what you said, I woke up one day, 10 years into a career uh, with lots of debt, lots of, you know, money and education and thought, what the F am I doing? What? (laughs) Why am I here? How did I get here? Um, I'm actually quite miserable. And it was it was a very profound moment. Um, And that's kind of the basis of it. I could go in deeper, but yeah, I woke up one day and I was literally in an office that had no windows. So it was basically a closet. I got handed a a computer by, um, it was the first day on a job that I got, got handed a computer and a list and they said, okay, go do your job. No guidance, no direction. And I sat in that office by myself. They shut the door and I could like hear this like really rumbly, terrible AC vent. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> like, This is totally not what I planned. How am I here? And I kind of broke down in that moment. And then it was such a profound moment for me. I went home and I said, I'm not doing that. I've got to find something else. And so I spent the next three plus years in therapy and working with coaches and trying to figure out who the hell I am. What's my purpose? Why did I waste 10 years doing something I ultimately hated? And that had nothing to do with who I was but what I thought I should do. So, yeah. Were you stuck in that situation that so many of us do? And that's, you said you were 10 years in school. Were you doing, you know, when I graduate, then I'll be happy? Mm. Were you in that trap? Yes. So I come from a family where education is everything. Um, Both my parents have PhDs. My dad's a medical doctor. Um, so there was no question that I had to go on. I couldn't just flail around. I I very much so believed I had to go to school. So I went to school, but I had no clue who I was or what I wanted to do. So I just picked the best, uh, major I could at the time. And I got that, I got in that cycle where you just keep taking classes. You just keep going. Nothing really is fulfilling you, but it's kind of working because you just keep going. Um, and I got trapped in that and I went all the way into completing a master's degree and I just never stopped. I just kept going, kept accumulating the school debt. And then I got pushed out and I had internships and I had these jobs, none of which fueled me, mind you, the whole entire time. I was like, eh, it's okay. The whole time. And yet, um, I kept going. So I got really stuck in that cycle because I didn't know what else to do. And I had no clue how to get out of it. Um, And I just kind of thought that was adulthood. That's a pretty bleak look at adulthood. (laughs) I I, I know, right? I was going to say, kudos to you, though. You figured it out much sooner than I did. It took me, I I think I was 44 when I finally, I didn't have a choice but to wake up because I basically ended ended up in the bottom of what I call shit barrel. Mm. So I had no choice but to climb my way out of it but you know you sort of you probably were halfway down shit barrel before you realized so you were you know in a different position yeah what what did working with those coaches and and counselors and therapists what did you learn from that experience well 
so much. Um, <laughs> I'm the funny thing is I'm actually a licensed marriage and family therapist. So that is what I went to school for all those years. And it wasn't, um, it was kind of in the direction that I was good at. It was something I was good at and it was easy for me for the most part to help people. And I wanted to genuinely help people, but the, the process of the structure and therapy was a little too rigid for me at times. And I never felt quite in alignment. And that's why I just kind of kept going and I got stuck in that trap. So I was lucky enough to have had the education to kind of give me that like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> you're pretty far down the barrel. Let's stop now and reroute. Um, but at the time I only knew of therapists. I didn't know life coaches were a thing. I didn't know I could call on somebody to help support me make those changes. Oftentimes uh, I like to, this is a little education. Um, I like to split the difference between coaching and therapy based on therapy really focusing on your past and coaching really pushing you into the future now there's more to it but that's kind of the basis so what the first thing i did was oh my gosh i have to go to therapy um but then i wasn't getting necessarily what i wanted i was really working on the root of things which was helpful uh but i got to a point where i just started googling and searching life coaches um you know, different hashtags, different, like I wanted hope, right? That had this terribly bleak future outlook on adulthood. And I knew that wasn't true. So I had to do something different. Um, and so I connected with a, a life coach, Erica Carico, who is phenomenal. And she was the individual who really um, helped me do the work. And that work was ripping back all of the shoulds, all of the societal expectations throwing them in the dumpster, lighting it on fire, and then coming back and asking myself honest questions of what I genuinely give a shit about and what do I really want my life to look like with no shame, with no worry, with no fear around it, but just love and light and hope and happiness, um, which is a lot harder to do <laughs> when you're actually trying to do it. Um, because I, you know, at that point I was just in such a negative headspace. So between the therapy, really working on like that root, why did I have that belief to begin with that I had to do all these things? You know, my childhood was a big piece of it. And then, you know, working with Erica and some other coaches to really help me change that pattern, change that belief, that story, um, that stigma, and not be afraid to kind of dive into who I really wanted to be, who I was really meant to be. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that was a roundabout way to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did your parents react? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> not the best. Um, yeah. my mom is the sweetest, most wonderful human on the planet who is always so accepting. So she's very accepting. Um, my dad, on the other hand, um, really looked at it as like, why, <laughs> why are you doing this? Or why are you shifting things? Um, and I got to the point where I realized like I, I couldn't do it for them. I had to do it for me. And I also had to be okay. And that was very hard for me. I had to be okay with potentially disappointing my dad, which was something that I thought was the worst thing in the world. Um, so, yeah. But as a parent, you know, we only want what makes our kids happy. So ultimately, as long as you're happy, he has to be happy. Yes, I, I would say that's true for many parents. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's, a can, that's a can of worms and we should maybe leave where it is. <laughs> uh, no, it, it is true. And he's really happy for me. Um, my dad is Middle Eastern. So the culture, the Middle Eastern culture is very much so about success and stability. So he was very concerned that without more of a formal position in a career, that I wouldn't have that safety, that security. I'm his daughter. He wants to make sure I can take care of myself. And I always appreciated that concern. Um, but it's that it makes generational sense. gap. Yeah, yeah no, it, no, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, depending on where your parents are from and what their upbringing is, they can look at what you're doing and think you're completely crackerjacks. I've tried to explain, you know, I try to tell my parents about podcasting. 
my parents <laughs> were born, you know, just as World War II was ending mm -hmm. in England. So they were raised with families that lived through the war. So the, you know, the concept of doing anything non-traditional, they just have no clue. And it's okay. Right. They just don't talk about it. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. like and whatever. I'm the youngest of six kids and there's a big age gap. So my dad was born in like 1940. So he is significantly older. And, and so for his time and in, in life, like his perspective of what, what am I doing? You know, he's looking yeah. at me like, what is this girl doing? I got her, I gave her a good education. I gave, you know, and I respect that. And I have to realize that that's just the generational difference. Yeah. I am very grateful for all that has been given to me. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately you've taken your education, you're just using it in a different way to help mm -hmm. other people live better lives. Exactly. That's so, what I'm trying to explain. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody's listening, and they're sitting there, they've got that same feeling of stuck. They're not mm -hmm. sure. They're looking at all this, these lists of the, the shoulds that they've done and they've ticked their boxes and they're like, I'm not happy. What the fuck's going on? Mm -hmm. What steps can somebody start to do to try and step towards what their purpose might be? Yeah, I think that's every client that I see <laughs> is, you know, they come to me and they're just so lost because whether they've lost themselves on the journey of life or they've ticked all those boxes off and they're still kind of sitting there. The biggest thing is I always have my clients take the time to value them themselves in a way that does not impact anybody else. So a lot of clients of mine have a lot of values for their family and that impact others. So their friends, their jobs, their coworkers, they've created all these values that are external. They're not internal. And society puts values on us too. So one of the first things I have my clients do to really uncover their purpose is I ask them, what the hell do you personally value? Not what you think you should value. What do you actually give a shit about? And more often than not, people are super surprised that they're living a life in a standard of values that actually isn't in alignment with their genuine value of life. What would you describe a value as? Because, you know, there's there's different terms that get thrown in. There's values, there's beliefs, there, you know, mm -hmm. just to help people understand what would a value be so that they can maybe start to identify what values already exist in their life? Great question. So values can be very flexible. It's simply words that have meaning to you that um, drive your behavior. So for, for me, you know, uh, adventure is a huge value of mine. Um, so is trustworthiness. I want a community that is small, but so trustworthy. And, um, you know, same with other people, it might be stability. Maybe it might be um, laughter. It can be any kind of word. You, I have clients just Google value lists and have them search words that have meaning to them. So after they go through the process of establishing their values, what can they do next? So once they really have their values, I, I try and get people to narrow their values down. So oftentimes I'll send them a values list. It has, you know, a hundred words on it and it's, I just have them highlight as many as they can. Then we come back and we kind of narrow a niche, ultimately trying to get down to like nine values. So those are those core values and you want them to be really relevant to your life and you want to see them. So I have them place them on a placard somewhere in their house. And then the next thing is I, I explain the difference between essence and expression. And I teach people about their essence is kind of that very core um, part of you that is your magic. Your essence is who you were as a little kid playing in the fields, completely um, unaware of the world around you, just living in the moment. What kind, what kind of personality did you have? What did you do? Were you the leader of the bunch? Were you the caretaker? Were you really artistic? Like what, what was your personality like when you were really little? That's your essence. It's before society gets a hold of you and starts chipping away and changing you, right? Um, yeah. And so I really have people spend time looking at what is your essence? And then the other flip of that is expression. And that's how do you take your essence 
and you put it out into the world, you express it. So that's either in your career, your personal life, um, your creativity, your hobbies, things like that. And C, if your essence, which is the nature of who you are, is being expressed in a healthy, positive way that feels good. Oftentimes it's being suppressed and you're not actually living in your essence. You are kind of putting a wet blanket on it and trying to fit a mold that isn't meant to be yours. And that's where you get that feeling of being stuck and being unhappy because for me, you're fighting that, that inner desire, your soul's pulling you to do something mm-hmm. yet you're doing something completely different. Exactly. Yeah. And it's often, you know, you get so far in it and that was me. I, you know, a decade into this career, all this expense, all this time, I didn't know what to do or how to do it. How do I leave? How do I shift? And yes, I was able to kind of take what I've already known and shift it a little bit, but sometimes it's like a total 180 and you're going from being, you know, an engineer to being an art teacher, you know, like it could be so different and that's okay. Um, But I think people are really afraid of that. People are scared how the how they want to know the how. Um, And a lot of it is, it's not so much the how is it's coming back to yourself and being open to the process and the how it comes together once Mm -hmm. once you learn what you're you know once you tap into that essence and you look for ways that you can express it in the world even taking taking one little step yes you know like you're saying if you're going to go from being an engineer to being an art teacher it's start posting your art on social media it's, right. it's, it's starting somewhere. It doesn't have to be like, Oh, I've decided I want to be an artist and I'm quitting my job and mm-hmm. selling my suits. And here we go. Yeah. It does not have to be all or nothing. And a lot of people think it does somehow you're just supposed to have a hundred thousand followers and 110% artwork all the time. And in reality, it's oftentimes a little slow. And I encourage people to keep their day jobs while they, while they build their dreams, whatever that may be. So there is excitement and hope and positivity instead of worry and financial struggle and that desperate energy when you're making that transition. And then, of course, in my opinion, I think you should hire a coach or a therapist that can help walk you through that so you're not alone and you have somebody guiding you, somebody maybe who's done it before, somebody to kind of help assist you because there's no way I could have done it by myself personally. I had no clue where to start and the starting off point's the hardest. So if you can find somebody that can suit your needs and you feel in alignment with, then you, you aren't alone. You've got that support and you can get a lot of questions answered along the way. Well, Liz, on that note, what is the best way for somebody to connect with you if they're looking at finding their purpose? Yes. So you can look me up at lizpasarin.com or you can find me on Facebook or Instagram at Liz Um, And I would love to talk to anybody. I always offer free discovery calls for 30 minutes where we can jump on a call and hear your story and see if coaching could be a good fit for you. If you are looking at connecting with Liz, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of the links in there. And Liz, Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Love it.